All right, Kiss Army. Welcome to the Kiss FAQ podcast. Thank you for giving us your time today. Nothing is into your head. I hope you don't do any damage. This is a Kiss related podcast by the board for the board. We hope that you enjoy. Welcome to episode 178 of the KISS FAQ podcast. I'm your host today, Julian Gill, and we have a special guest returning to the podcast. So Jeff Seuss, co-author of KISS Alive Forever, the seminal book on KISS's touring history, 1973 to 2000, and also Inside Casablanca, co-author with Larry Harris. That, uh, that about sums it up. And you also were a contributor to the original KISS crew book, uh, helped them out with that, I believe. That yeah, and, and Lydia's Lydia Chris's book as as well. Seal um, the kiss. I'm going to meet her for the first time in a couple of weeks at the Indie Expo. I'm very much oh, looking right? forward to that. Of all the guests there, um, I've not met her previously, and I you know just to be able to tell her thank you for that wonderful book will be uh, be nice. And uh, maybe you, I'll, maybe I'll pick up another copy to use as a giveaway. You'll like her a lot. Lydia's a real sweetheart, and it was a, it was a, it was a privilege and a lot of fun to to work with her uh, on that on that book. And Kurt and I have both been very very glad, uh, you know, proud of her and happy for her that she so you know successfully kind of realized the vision she had for the book. And I, and I agree, even though I'm I'm a little partial, uh, uh, that it is a fantastic book. There's no question about it. And thank you for having me on the show once again. Yeah, it uh, just seems like a, well, it does seem like a couple of months since we last saw each other at the Atlanta Expo, where I was uh, yeah. I was actually blessed with the opportunity to Q&A both you and Kurt live on stage with about five minutes notice. So <laughs> thank you for being patient with me and holding my hand through that process, because I had a blast being up on the stage uh, with the pair of you and, you know, covering some of the, I, I guess, more general topics uh, about Kiss Alive Forever and the stuff that you did. I still didn't, I never got to see your wonderful video that day either. I I mean, you're kidding. I was I was that busy. I just never had a chance to actually come over, step away from my table and everything that I was involved in and go over and see that. So, yeah, th there you go. Yeah. Uh, I look forward to, you know, maybe the next time you guys make an appearance at an expo um, when, you know, let, let's let's bring it up right now. When a second edition of Kiss Live Forever comes, I'm sure you guys are going to do the expo round. So I, I look forward to that. That was a question that was Absolutely. posted on the FAQ this week. But uh, let's just talk about uh, Atlanta. You guys put out okay. um, a special reprint of Kiss Live Forever, Indeed. which had the very, very oh, cool man. photo of Vinny on the cover. Yeah. And you guys have a, a few copies left, so you know what can people do if they've missed the opportunity in Atlanta or with the uh, the previous mail order in order to get a copy, and uh, how how soon that should they move on that? Uh, move pretty quickly. I don't know the exact number of books we have left, but it's I'm guessing it, there's just a few boxes left, so it's, it's probably forty or fifty copies. Um, if you're here in the United States, they're forty dollars a piece and ten dollars shipping. Uh, you know, anywhere in the United States. Um, and you can go literally to, you know, our, our PayPal at webmaster at kissaliveforever.com and purchase just directly there. Uh, or if you're anywhere else in the world, uh, just email us at uh, billboardbooks at icloud.com. That's Kurt's address. And he'll chat with you and figure out, you know, where to send the book and work out the best uh, um, shipping options for you. And um, yeah, everybody's really liked it. It's it's basically the the same book that came out in two thousand two, uh, especially kind of printed up to for that Atlanta celebration. Vinny decided to stop being the Greta Garbo of rock and roll and and reappear. And um, everybody seems to have, have, have really enjoyed it. We had uh, you know much like you, uh, the, that convention went by in a blur. And uh, there are just hundreds, if not you know, over a thousand people, kind of filtering by the table um, pretty quickly. We're all packed in there like sardines, but it was uh, you know, it's a fun community to hang out with. And and believe it or not, even though you and I have known each other cybernetically for twenty whatever years, that was the first time we'd actually you know met in person. So that was that was a lot of fun. So you know, you, you certainly uh, you know deserve your accolades for picking up the baton from uh, what's the guy's name, Alex Carranza, all those years ago from the original FAQ. If, if we're going really original gangster, back in the mid '90s. But yeah, I think you've been helming that indefatigably for twenty what twenty two years. 
something like that yeah yeah something like that yeah so or as gene would say something similar uh you know it, it, <laughs> it, it it's not one of those things i never expected to be uh, saying i've been a webmaster for over 20 years i've known you and kurt for over 20 years online it, it and yeah. you know and so many other people that i met for the first time in atlanta because i stepped out of the expos when my son was born and just stopped going to them and traveling and i hadn't gone to that many yeah. anyway so i wasn't a part of the big expo scene in the 90s like so many other fans were so right f for me any opportunity to go to an expo it, it's just like uh, i i use the the phrase tribal communion all the time to kind of des describe it because it's just so much fun you meet people who you only know by an alias and then you can put a face to a name to an alias yeah. and most people nowadays do use their real names which helps rather than hi i'm uh admin or <laughs> yeah you know or hi i've been yeah, banned yeah. It, it was funny when uh, Kurt and I were actually at the Orlando, what was it called, Spooky Empire uh, Expo. I live here in Tampa, so it was just a, you know an hour's drive away from me. But um, uh, we went up there to say hello to Vinny because um, it's such a short drive. And while we were there, I met a guy whose screen name is going to be nothing to nobody named Elder Steve, who in a weird roundabout way is kind of the reason that Kiss Alive Forever happened. But the funny thing was – is he's introducing himself to Vinny. He's like, yeah, I'm Steve Schneider from, you know, Orlando. I'm a writer. And I'm like, oh, my God, Elder Steve, because <laughs> nobody used nobody used the real name for that stuff. And there, there was a guy that I'd known literally since, what, 1994, 95, uh, uh, by a screen name that has been out of use for almost that long. But, yeah, I literally remembered him. Wow, you're Elder Steve from AOL way back in the mid-'90s. So, uh, yeah, I, I, I get it. Yeah, people – People used to be a weird handle, and you're like, oh, your name's Mark. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, it's, it's a lot of fun to meet people and uh, just hear their reactions to, you know, to the stuff that, you know, Kurt and I have worked on. I'm sure you had the same uh, vibe from all the things that you've done, yeah. uh, people just giving you feedback, and um, it, it's, like you said, it's a great community. Yeah, what I found in my experience is the feedback, the positive and the, the, the constructive criticism has all been wonderful. You know, people have been so supportive over the the decades of the Kiss AVQ and all the all the things that I've done that it's it's always nice to meet people and to hear their opinions. I loved it. one guy came in with a sack, you know, basically an army rucksack full of my books. I mean, there were like eleven. Oh my of goodness! Them, and he's like, "You're signing every single one of these, and you're not leaving until they're signed." I was like, "Sir, <laughs> yes, sir. How would you like them dedicated?" Because just to see that many things coming back in. Is also. I'm sure you guys feel the same when someone brings you a dog-eared copy of the original Kiss oh. Alive Forever, and oh, yeah. it's it's it looks like it's on its last legs. And they're like, can you please sign this for me? You know, or you there know, was somebody that brought theirs in, and it literally had to be binder clipped together. And it's like, okay, well, you certainly got your twenty nine ninety five out of that copy of it. You, you, um, you totally did. I mean, I've got a copy behind me that's binder clipped. I had to take it in. Actually, this yeah. one, I, I, I cut the, the binding off myself because it was falling apart. So I got the X-Acto knife out and I cut it off, put the, you know, the those big yeah. one inch binder clips. It, you know, it, it's yeah. pathetic in one sense, especially mine, which had all my, my red notes on written over the pages, things highlighted. Yeah. It, it, it's just a wonderful thing that you can do with the book and then you can go out and get a brand new pristine copy that you're never going to write in uh, <laughs> right right yeah 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 like i've like i've said before it, it's both a sense of, of 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 pride and also a bit of horror when people would say oh you know i've used the book so much that the bindings broke and you're like well that sucks but then we start thinking we literally had no idea when we published that people would read it that much and it's not even so much that they read it. They just use it as a reference mm -hmm. guide. And, you know, we thought, like most books, you'd pick it up, you'd read it once, and maybe you refer back to it, you know, every now and again. But so many people, you know, just pick it up almost on a daily basis and to, you know, look up some, you know, some figure or figure out, you know, when was that date? And, uh, yeah, a lot of them fell, you know, kind of fell apart. So, I'm glad people got that much use out of it. Uh, I'll put it that way. Yeah, for me, it's always been something that I could just pick up and flip through. I, you didn't need to start at any chapter. You didn't need to start at oh, any yeah. page. You could literally just open it up and start and find something interesting. And even after all these years, what, 15 years, you could still yeah. open it up and find something new. So Yeah, it's it's. I, I like to think of it now. It's, it's 288 pages of clickbait. Uh, totally, yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> and and hope so, you know what i yeah. what i find it is the things that aren't in there that are the stuff that i look forward to and that's uh, partially why your guest on today's show is yeah obviously a, a new 1974 recording has has turned up but one question that gets asked no matter how many times you answer it wherever you answer it i'm still not used to your new handle on the faq um i i'm just i preferred the old one so i was just so used to oh, that yeah. so um one person did ask a, a question about a perspective um updated version of kiss alive forever so mm -hmm. you know let, let's just let everyone know what you and kurt are working on for the future what your plans are at this point though obviously everything can change you know where are you guys at and what are you thinking about for the future yeah we always since day one we always knew that we were going to you know do an updated version of this and we kind of without really really even discussing it always assumed that we would do it when you know kiss you know called it a career which in 2002 we were thinking well you know probably won't be that much longer but you know here we are what you know 15 16 whatever years later and they're still going but it sounds like maybe you know the the end is is not so far away and i say that you know with you know some you know a, a sense of bittersweetness uh, to it so uh, as for the future plans of kiss life forever we're absolutely going to do an updated version uh, in theory, let's say, you know, KISS wraps things up uh, within the next 24 months, uh, we would certainly do a, a, a version of it that would cover literally from 1973 or, heck, 1971, we'll go back to Wicked Lester and cover everything up till, you know, the final show. And that would not only include, obviously, the updates since we originally published um, up to the present, but also just literally hundreds upon hundreds of different little additions, corrections, deletions, all, all sorts of new information on the original, uh, the original time frame uh, of the first printing, which is 71 to 2002. Uh, so yes, we will absolutely definitely be, be producing something like that, which you know, I hope will be the, you know, the definitive uh, work on, on Kiss's uh, uh, you know, concert history. Uh, so yes, th there will be a, a, a completely updated, uh, start to finish version of of Kiss Alive Forever. Kiss Three Three, no, that would, yeah, that, that wouldn't pay. <laughs> 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 All right, so let's let's get to Toronto seventy four. Is the yes. la the latest, greatest, and most unexpected of gifts that uh, oh, fans that fa no one saw this uh, this coming. No, I I was. I literally got um, uh, got a message from Nick Vivid um, and uh, another person I've known for more years than I could count. And he said, hey, new 1974 show. Check it out. And I'm like, what? Come on. And, you know, because usually I'll expect it to be, although not with Nick. Nick knows his stuff, so he wouldn't, he wouldn't BS me. But, um, yeah, there was a link to it, and there it is. You know, the Toronto, was it September 14th, 74 yeah. show. And, um, yeah, I, you got the link, listen to it. Um, it's a really good, you know, audience recording, uh, you know, completely listenable. Um, and it was, you know, it was surprising, and I'm sure, you know, it, it raised your eyebrows, too, that um, th this was the second night back after they finished recording Hotter Than Hell. That's they right. played in, yeah, they played up at the uh, uh, Wilford Laurier uh, Theater in uh, Kitchener, I believe, on September 13th. So that was the first night back. But so we got a show from the second night. Um, tough to tell if it's the first or second show because there were two shows that night. I, I guess maybe it's the first show because usually when they do more than one, Paul will reference something like, you know, hey, the earlier show was louder or, yeah. or whatever, and there's no reference. So, but that's just a guess. But of course, the, the real find in that is right in the middle of set, there's Parasite, um, which Com was. Complete with a false start on it as well, which I, I oh, like yeah, yeah. at the end of the previous hack, he, he just starts the riff and stops and then it goes. So, yeah. I, I always like that sort of thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that, that, that was really interesting because um, even though we have um, two shows from very, very early on, I think the second night, maybe the fifth night of the or fourth night of the Hotter Than Hell uh, tour, just a month later, which, you know, has both Parasite and Got to Choose on it, um, I w had never really thought about uh, whether or not they'd really added uh, material 
uh, to the set, uh, you know, in, in that, that little time frame between September 13th and October 4th, which is that last little leg, what we kind of call the kiss tour. And that, that was a fine, that was, that was an eye opener. What, uh, you know, uh, were you surprised at that or? For, for me, it's always been a giant mystery. At what point did the hotter than hell material come into the band set? Did it, I, you know, obviously with us having uh, Hammond and East and the, the brewery, East Lansing being the two recordings, yeah. uh, you know, with Got to Choose and Parasite, um, it, it was pretty clear that one of those was going to be the contender. You know, I, I can't remember really right. if, if I thought that both came in at the, the same time, but I kind of tended to believe that Got to Choose would have been the first one to come into the set. <laughs> And yeah, here we are. I'm wrong. And that's the for me, that's the importance of this, the show coming out is it, it lets us identify Parasite being the first song from Hotter Than Hell is obviously uh, Baby Let Me Go, as it was then retitled Let Me Go Rock and Roll doesn't count as it had long been in the set. Um, yeah, yeah. To, you know, so that 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 was always there. So Parasite's the first song from the album to get into the set, unless obviously, you know, the previous night is substantially different, and you know, the Kitchener, right? I, I really doubt is going to be very different uh, just from no. the way Kiss generally did business at the time. Right, right. I I, I agree, and um, yeah, it was that was such a surprise that 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 uh, that show came out. And um, it, it's really interesting because usually Kiss's sets were pretty static. So even when they'd make a change, it usually tended to be, you know, somewhere in the middle of the set, they're going to swap out, you know, they're going to swap out, come on and love me for room service or, you know, that's where all the new songs tended to, to pop in right in the middle of the set there. And they just kind of swap them out because the beginning of the set was always front loaded after a certain point with Deuce and Strutter. Um, and then, you know, um, you know, got to choose and, Powder and Hell, Firehouse, She, that, that seemed to be so standard. And then the back end was always seemed to be, you know, Black Diamond, you know, Cold Gin, Rock and Roll Night, Let Me Go Rock and Roll. It was that center section that always seemed to be swapped around. But, yeah, it's fascinating to see that the Parasite got, got bumped in there. Um, so then we know Got to Choose obviously got added next uh, when the Hotter Than Hell tour, you know, started. And they started headlining uh, more often than not. And then by... Um, December, um, we know from, uh, I think it was Bowling Green University, where they had what William F. Buckley as their, their opening act, so to speak. <laughs> oh, the the um, speaker of the afternoon yes. of, the, of the show, that's right. Yes, exactly. Yes, let's discuss Solzhenitsyn's Gulag Archipelago, please. And, you know, that segues into Deuce. That would have been an interesting <laughs> afternoon. <laughs> but, but anyway, uh, but, but interestingly, watching you, had been added to the set list by then. So then you start getting, you know, it's like, okay, when was that added? And we know, for instance, that uh, Strange, or we also know um, from a couple of uh, people who attended the event that Mainline made an appearance at a couple shows at the end of November. And that left, sounds like pretty quickly. And Strange Waves was in the show in Vancouver in January of 75 for at least that one night, if not, you know, a couple more. And then obviously that disappeared. So you're always looking, hey, where are the moments that, you know, something jumps in for a little bit and then gets swapped out and they're just, well, this song works. Let's try this. And Toronto was a great, you know, kind of eye opener in terms of figuring out, you know, say, oh, wow, they added they added new material before before the album came out. Um, but the real nerd question is now for that Toronto show is let me go rock and roll still baby let me go or should it be titled let me go rock and roll because the album wasn't out yet but they recorded it yeah uh what do the studio sheets from the album sessions because i i know at one point kurt had some of those with yes. the actual song title. I, I think i remember seeing watching you um got yes. to choose so those mixed down sheets for the studio time, you know, what is the title used there? So had the song attained the title before the artwork was created for the album? Because obviously it wasn't released until a, yeah. you know, a few weeks after this. So, yeah I'm, yeah, I'm calling it Let Me Go Rock and Roll now. That's how the, the chap listed it. I loved actually the uh, the torrent that the show came in. They, the, the chap actually included a scan of the J card from the cassette tape and, <laughs> yeah, and yeah, the yeah, cassette I tape. I, I just love that sort of detail. The two question marks for the, uh, the two songs. He had no idea what they were at the time. Right. Uh, yeah. 
And 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 then uh, it was also uh, he did a little background on the Victory uh, Victory Theater, the burlesque theater where they performed, which I thought, okay, here's a guy that really did his really did his homework. He made a presentation out of this. It wasn't just for, for someone and, who wasn't a Kiss fan either. That, yeah, that was sort of the first thing he said out of the bat. I am not a Kiss fan, but here's. Uh, you know, a bunch of research on the burlesque theater, its history, Kiss being the last band to perform there. Oh, by the way, uh, let's see if I have it here. We included a scan of, what's that? Cheap, oh, yeah. Cheap Thrills, the CPI magazine, which uh, came out in April 76, which included a feature that was uh, an interview from from that night in 1974, Gene and Paul oh, cool. kind of goofing around. So he really put together the whole package, which uh, is surprising. I mean, the burlesque theater, I hadn't really ever known that side of its history because in everything that I ever really saw, it was just the Victory Theater, not the Victory Burlesque. So, yeah. So that that was drew my attention to it in, in a new sort of way, which I, I find very interesting. So, what do you think? I, I mean, what what is your opinion? Is it Baby Let Me Go, or is it Let Me Go Rock and Roll at this point? From from what I remember on those track sheets from um, Village Recorders, uh, it was actually still listed as Baby Let Me Go on the track sheets. Uh, but you know, when they actually decided, okay, let's call this Let Me Go Rock and Roll, uh, I don't know if we'll ever be able to drill down that way. So it's kind of an academic academic question. You know, you could say, well, until it comes out in print, it's still Baby Let Me Go. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I'm not I'm not jumping in with both feet on the issue. <laughs> I, I could I could really I'm pretty ambivalent on it because, you know, I see both sides to it. Yeah, I, I, I agree with that. It, if anything, it now makes me more interested in kind of following the paper trail at Casablanca for when that transition in the song title does occur. Yeah. Ju ju I mean, come on, this is the only the sort of stuff people who need therapy care about. Um, yes. No one else, you know, there are probably listeners to the show right now who are saying, oh my God, they're, art they're discussing when a song <laughs> became a song, it's the same yeah. song, get alive. <laughs> but, right, 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 right. Yeah, exactly. But it, it, it's, yeah, but it, it's such a, a great transition piece. Yeah, well, and it's, you know, it's this type of psychosis that, you know, ends up creating, you know, books. So <laughs> I'm not going to knock it too much. Yeah, record but, label uh, variations, song title, evolutions, you know, it, it does generate a lot of reading material one way or the other. I think the set list is also interesting because, uh, again, some of the armchair critics said, well, it's the same stuff as everything else in 1974. It isn't because yeah. if, you, if you go back to the previous show, which we do have, uh, and that South Bend, yeah. right before they finish up the touring and head into the studio, you've got Deuce, Nothing to Lose, She, Firehouse, Strutter, 100,000 Years, Black Diamond, and and then baby let me go by the time yeah. they hit the road after now you start to see deuce and strutter together at the beginning which yes that that's what grabbed my attention as well that you, you're it's kind of the inevitable march towards a live and the more familiar kind of, right. of set list um yeah I'm also shocked by how good the recording is for something that was sitting on the backside of a Max Webster tape. Recorded, <laughs> yeah. recorded. Uh, what was it on a Yamaha KX260 deck? Um, stunningly clear, and it, that automatically makes it one of the better recordings of that, you know, era, to my ears. Yeah, and and it was yeah you're right for for a tape that's you know 40 years old and who knows how it had been stored. Uh, it was it was very very listenable. It was uh, I could also envision you know somebody pressing record on a tape deck, and all I could think was, Gene's SVTs are just absolutely abusing the heck out of what, what whatever poor microphone is recording this. Um, and yeah, if somebody who, who was uh, you know good with Pro Tools or something you know went in there and you know dropped the bass and mids down a little bit, you'd end up with something even even more more listenable because it, it had some pretty punchy bass. But it didn't, dis you know, uh, you could still hear everything in there. You could hear the vocals pretty cleanly, uh, the guitars. Uh, you could focus on anything you wanted to uh, with it. And it was it, it was really good. I mean, there were a couple little flub-ups. Uh, one thing that jumped out at me, I don't know if you caught it, but when um, they finished the set and were about ready to come back on encores, uh, J.R. Smalling grabbed the mic again and kind of, you know, tried to rile the crowd up a little bit which uh, 
for, it's been a while since I've listened to all those old tapes, but I I didn't remember him doing that before, and I thought that was I thought that was kind of interesting too. Yeah, I thought they were teasing for another encore because when you look at the next show, uh, Hammond, October the eighteenth. The set yeah. closes out with cold gin, and that's not present here. And it does. There's no good night, Toronto. There's no. Uh, there's no nothing from the band. It's like they left the stage and didn't come back for a, a, a song. To me, it, it feels right. like if, if it, the, the show feels incomplete, like that is missing uh, from the recording. And I, I don't know whether that's the case or not. That's just there's something about how it does end that's very odd. Maybe it's because Jr. or you know comes out and, and does something different that it feels awkward, but there, there's something odd to me. Right. Yeah. And I didn't, I didn't stop to look at the, the total running time um, to see if it was a, it was a matter of like uh, at the Winterland show, the, the video where literally the tape ran out, you know, let me go rock and roll does not finish. Uh, come as a conclusion on the Winterland video from January 31st, 75, because they ran over their 16 minutes. Um, so I don't know if that was the case here. I don't think it was. I, I, I didn't think it was uh, 60 minutes long, but yeah, who knows? You might be right. Yeah, maybe maybe there is a a missing song, uh, a missing song there. But um, yeah, even with their headlining shows, when they got to the Hotter Than Hell tour when they had basically 11 songs and the solos themselves had grown from, you know, just a moment or two to something that might be, you know, like Ace and Jeans kind of grew up to, you know, be a couple minutes and Peter's really started growing. Um, even then, they, they, weren't, they weren't on stage a terribly long time. Um, so, yeah, that, I, maybe there is a song missing. Yeah, uh, uh, Toronto, I've just so. done, done. I've thrown it into Winamp, and the the show length's for, just over forty nine minutes. So, uh, on a yeah. on a C sixty T or a C one twenty sixty minute per side. Right, right, right. right. Yeah, and that when yeah. I saw one twenty, I thought, man, that's even more impressive that that made it in such good condition that long because that's really thin tape. Yeah, one twenties. Yeah. In fact, I was surprised that I didn't even know that they had one twenties back quite that far. No, yeah. that that was a revelation for me as well. But uh, you, you went back to a proper transfer. That would be absolutely wonderful. I mean, some of the tapes that I've taken into studios, and uh, my engineer sits there doing, he's got an oscillator and he does the phase alignment on the heads uh, to get optimal, oh, yeah. optimal track. I mean, he does all sorts of voodoo to me. He, he's sitting there explaining it to me and I'm just sitting there kind of nodding my head, just mm -hmm. write, just <laughs> write, just continuing to write the check. Um, but he's done, right. I mean, he's, he's baked even those cassettes. He takes them out of the clamshells and bakes up you know does the full monty on everything that goes in there i mean i would love to hear it tweaked um so that that i mean yeah i i think the character that we get is indicative of just how loud a kiss show was in 1974 and it, yeah it's described in so many interviews as an assault on the senses and that really does mm -hmm. come across with gene's thumping bass predominantly the low end that's in in those shows you're just like bleeding ears almost you can tell yeah 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 the, the words painfully loud have been spoken by or written by so many people uh you know back then and uh yeah you and that's what you can kind of hear you know no microphone that's just kind of randomly placed to you know grab grab a concert in fashion like this is going to be able to keep up with that but yeah i considering like you said that that just fell out of the sky i'm not complaining in the least <laughs> that it's a little a little bottom heavy yeah. um but yeah cause I, that was i'm not such... i'm not complaining i didn't have to spend any money <laughs> so, you know. I, exactly and nor nor did you have to wait because you didn't know it was coming. It's like here you go, present, nineteen seventy four. Yeah. You know, just I, you know, looking back to that message popping up, new seventy four show. Uh, just yeah, it was drop what I'm doing, run, yeah. and you know, get logged in, and oh my god, it's real. <laughs> Which you know, I, I'm not going to say it's a historic tape. It's not like uh, some of the shows that you've mentioned, say, recording a mainline. I think uh, certainly or strange oh, ways yeah. or. No, the other one that we've kind of uh, mentioned briefly on the board, Kissing Time, for that matter. Yeah. And you've raised a very good point about that from the 1974 shows. And I'm mm -hmm. a big proponent for believing from the evidence that I've seen that Winterland 74 still exists um, and, you know, is you know, under lock and key. But you raised a good point. Look at the set list from the night before from that classic bootleg, right? 
Yeah. And yeah. there's no kiss in time. And it's the exact same billing. Kiss, opening, Manfred Mann in the middle, and Savoy Brown headlining. So, and, and I'll take full responsibility. Well, I'll take 50% responsibility. <laughs> Kirk gets the other yeah, 50%. Leave him a little bit, too. Yeah, absolutely. He gets a share. Um, because, like, we wrote in there, and we were laughing about this today. And I was like, what the hell were we thinking? Why did we write that, you know, this was likely on there when we could very clearly see from less than 24 hours before that it wasn't in the set? And we knew that, um, you know, they hated, they, they hated the whole idea. Um, this, this actually kind of, and, and, you know, we think we know that it was played at least twice. Once um, in Portland at the Northwest Paramount Theater, and I'm going by memory here, I think May 26th, the 74, and then again in Vancouver on the 28th, uh, um, 74. Um, but we're a little unclear when it first got added to the set list, if it was added, you know, uh, when they started that little Canadian uh, you know, run uh, in mid-May, uh, or if it was added in the middle of that. And, you know, it seems to be clear that it was gone permanently, maybe, maybe not, by the time they did uh, the Long Beach uh, show on the 31st. Um, but, yeah, obviously that would be the rare kiss song uh you know to find uh you know from that year uh but um i was going to bring up something else kind of related to this is that one of the things kurt and i've been working on lately and we've done a lot of of a serious deep dive into some really early kiss um mysteries over the past couple of months uh, in particular, trying to figure out when the Wicked Lester gigs happened, if there were six of them or seven of them or three of them. or uh, And then I've been doing a ton of research on the kissing contests. Oh, really? From, Fascinating. Yeah, from April, May, and June. There were kind of three sets of them. And running through the timeline, and just from my research, and there's no way I have canvassed all of the newspapers uh, in the U.S., uh, but just from my research over the last month, there were over 300 newspaper articles, probably two to three times more than that if we had all the available newspapers, over 300 newspaper articles on those, those contests. And just as a refresher course to people, they started uh, with one in Fort Lauderdale, just north of Miami, on April 20th, and it was just one. That went over so well, Larry Harris was contacted by the Warner uh, rep in Miami about that. Uh, brought his attention uh, before the contest was even over because it lasted for, I don't know, four, four and a half days. And he brought it, a guy by the name of Eddie Pugh brought it to Larry Harris's attention on the 21st. Larry thought it was a great idea, walked into Neil's office that next morning, said, hey, what if we did, um, you know, uh, some kissing contest to promote the band? And Neil told him, that's fantastic. Go to your radio contacts and see if you can find people that will sponsor events. And so Larry, who had done a lot of work with radio when he was at Buddha Records with Neil, uh, started doing that. And very early on in that process, maybe as, as soon as that day or the next, he had contacted Scott Shannon, who would later impact Kiss heavily with his flipping over of the B-side of the Detroit Rock City single. But um, he suggested to Larry, hey, why doesn't the band cover the Bobby Rydell tune? And Neil and so Larry brought that idea back to Neil, and Neil said, "Yeah, let's do that." Um, and then told Larry, "You know, what are the list of radio stations who have agreed to do this?" And Larry gave him that list, and Neil then went to Bill Coin and said, "You guys need to record this, and you need to rewrite the lyrics with these cities on board, which is why all the cities uh, are completely different, and there's like twice as many uh, from the Bobby Rydell." and the KISS versions. And then by the 26th, KISS were at Bell Sound Studio. And that, that all literally happened, you know, between the 20th of April from the first phone call till KISS was putting the finishing touches on, on that within five or six days. And the, the real explosion took place when uh, the first contest, which was held um, in, on April 20th in Lauderdale, a place called the Button Lounge, um, there was an AP wire reporter who, that was his watering hole. That's where he went to drink every night. <laughs> and he showed, he showed up there and he's like, what are all these people doing in my bar? 
And because there were literally a hundred people in this contest, it, it was you know right around the time of spring break, so they got all of these people uh, in, involved in this contest. And once he saw what was happening, he's like, "Wow, I got to write about this!" And boom, it hit the APY reports, and that's how it took off like wildfire to the rest of the country. And so the second batch of them, which more or less corresponded to the 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 cities in the Kiss and Time lyrics. Happened on May 11th, 74, um, you know, in places, Dallas, Houston, Chicago, um, uh, Charlotte, Cleveland, Cincinnati, New York, um, and I forget where else. It's not an exact correspondence, but pretty close. And they did and get so, a lot of coverage for those because I remember going through the newspaper did. archives and just, the, yes. it, it's, it's stunning the amount of coverage that they did get at that early point for something that really, you know, we kind of take for granted now is just something that they did. Yeah, absolutely. And, and so those got a little bit more press and then the winners of those contests, I think there were a total of 15 of them. The winners of those contests got invited to Chicago, uh, where they had the kind of the, the kiss off finals at Woodfield Mall on June 8th. The uh, Woodfield's just outside of Chicago, uh, straight west of Chicago by about 30 minutes. And, uh, at Woodfield Mall, which is then the largest mall in the world, they had the, uh, you know, they staged the uh, the contest and or the the finals contest. And in the process of reach, researching this, I've found the names of fifty different contestants in those various uh, contests. And I've I've had the opportunity to talk to a few of them. There's there's one couple I talked to that were married at the time they took place. And they're from Detroit and they won the Detroit finals and then went to Chicago and I think finished fourth. They had been married 14 years by the time they took place in that that event in 74, and they are still married today. Wow. Uh, yes, they're, I think this year they're celebrating their 60th wedding anniversary. And they remembered it like it was yesterday. And even though I won't get into the full details because we want, we want to kind of save it for, you know, a, a, a project later on, which, you know, unfortunately I can't get into the details of yet, so there's – a little carrot dangling for anybody who's interested, but um, uh, it, they, they, the the contest. One of the contestants told me that she was that they had a a, a dinner uh, on June seventh. This is the night before the contest was going to begin. This would have been a Friday, June seventh, and she and her husband, who was her partner, they were both I think eighteen and nineteen years old, um, uh, were sitting next to Jean, and, and so. She is literally this woman's eight months pregnant. And Jean, while sitting next to her, eight months pregnant, and her husband, you know, 18 inches away, offers her his room key to his hotel room. And I'm like, dude, you, that is so ballsy oh. and so shameless. So 70s and, as well. Oh, yeah, yeah, completely. And, and um, it, it was very interesting. Um, learning uh, about that and and talking to the people who were involved with it, this, some of the people that were involved in staging the initial contest in Lauderdale, and talking to some of the people that were involved in um, you know Detroit and Cleveland, and then several people that were involved in the, in the finals. There's a tremendous amount of photos and film and uh, and and just all sorts of amazing stuff, but it was. It, it, it was unbelievable, the coverage that this thing got. And I think most KISS fans, if they've got a memory of it, it's probably of KISS hating the song, yep. being forced to record the song, and then, you know, the winners being, you know, that guy with the big, huge, you know, Unabomber beard. Oh, Vinny and, Del, was it Vinny Del Toro or, or, or Vinny, Louise? Vinny, Vinny and Louise. Yeah, Louise Heath and Vinny Toro. Yeah, and um, that, you know, that's probably their abiding memory of it. But this was a sensation. This thing literally was covered nationwide. I, I'm not lying. There, I found newspaper articles in the London Mirror. I found newspaper articles on it in Hamburg, West Germany, uh, Tokyo, uh, Australia, uh, all mostly because it and, – and Stars and Stripes, which is the U.S. Armed Service um, uh, newspaper – uh, that's published in several different places uh, uh, around the world. Um, all of them covered this. 
And it, it literally became, it, it kind of took over uh, from the streaking sensation that was all the craze back then where people would, you know, just drop trow and sprint across the Oscars stage naked or whatever. It actually grabbed headlines away from that. And there were kissing contests in cities that weren't related to this for probably about four to six months. It was a real pop culture event, all because of a, of a silly little idea some guys had down in, in Fort Lauderdale to promote the Kiss album. It's just, I mean, fascinating stuff. Fascinating stuff. I, I think one of the, the very <clears throat> interesting th points on that as well is, was not the winner of the Fort Lauderdale, uh, the original one, supposed to be flown to mm -hmm. Toronto to attend a Kiss yes. show at the Victory Theater in Toronto? That's on true. On April the 26th, got... which got canceled. Yes, because that was an Argent show, and Argent had some. They, they, Argent canceled a bunch of shows around that time. I think because they were having difficulties with their work visa, being from you know Britain, um, they they had a whole big tour scheduled with Kiss, and only you know they had to cut I don't know three weeks worth of this stuff um, out of their itinerary for some reason, and that was one of the shows. But one of the funny things about that was, um, you know, these guys in Miami said, well, we'll just fly the winners to the next KISS show. And so that started on the 20th. And there was a show in Charlotte that they knew, well, we can't fly them up there because maybe the contest will last till the next day. And that'll be too tight a window to get the winners up to Charlotte to see KISS at this little place called Flashes. So the Victory Theater was the next date. Well, the contest went on Saturday and Sunday and Monday and Tuesday, and it's getting to be Wednesday, and these guys are going, these, this contest isn't even going to be over <laughs> in time to fly anybody up to Toronto. Um, so even if it hadn't, Argent hadn't canceled, I'm not sure they would have been able to take them up there anyway. But yeah, that's, that's an interesting bit of symmetry that, um, that it was at the, at the Victory Burlesque Theater and that canceled show. So instead of actually doing that show at the Victory, they're in this, the Bell Sound studio that day as well. So... It, Correct. It, it's just wild how these like little kissing time bits and pieces of minutia all thread back together. I mean, absolutely nuts. And then afterwards, I mean, when we're talking about kissing time being performed, there aren't that many right. shows between what heading back on on the road because they don't really head back on the road because of the Argent problems. They've got one show at uh, the Passaic Theater, uh, Capitol Theater, in Passaic, right. New Jersey, and then it's the Mike uh, Douglas. Mike Douglas. Uh, I'm just quickly scrolling through, uh, and then May they've got uh, Thunder the brewery, Ch Thunder, not, Chicken. Thunder Chicken, Thunder Chicken, and then St. Louis, yeah. St. Louis at the Ambassador Theater. And right. that, that was the last St. Louis. That was the last of the Argent shows because didn't they get kicked off the, that tour immediately after that anyway? <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, that was that was the night Jr. decided he had had enough of Solomon, the Argent road manager, and said, "Yeah, yeah, take a seat, buddy." Um, and yeah, and that was that was the end of that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, it's a good question. That's one of the questions we may never have an answer to is, you know, exactly when did Kiss and Time, you know, enter and leave the set. But, I, I, you know, one of the funny things is, and I don't think we published this because I think I found it after we originally published. There is an article, a review from the Long Beach show in January of 75 that says, you know, Kiss had the, the you know, the, the crowd at Long Beach Auditorium really, you know, really rocking um, and stomping their feet with such numbers as nothing to lose in Kissing Time. It's January of 75. And you read that and you're like, what? what? <laughs> exactly. But what happens, and this is why newspaper reviews aren't always terribly reliable, is a lot of times you get sloppy newspaper reporters who are trying to meet a deadline. And they're thinking, well, I'll stay for a few minutes, and then I'll just backfill the rest of the information with stuff I can read in the press kit. So what are nothing to lose but kissing time but singles, which have certainly been mentioned in a press kit. So I think that that newspaper review by whoever did it was just, you know, a guy saying, you know, just kind of phoning in a review for a show he may only have attended a portion of, because that would be, it's not impossible, of course, but that would be unbelievable for them to have, you know, dropped that back into the set for, you know, for well, a night. Well, but, that, that that far afterwards wouldn't, but then again, yes. you know, you're, you're hardly going to think that they're going to be aware of Hotter Than Hell as a single at that point, right? Because... 
Yeah. Right. It, it, it's just not right. going to be something that's out there. They would have known of three singles and why not mention, you know, there, there you go. But, yeah. you, you know, in doing research into dates, so it's always about multiple sources, isn't it? You know, a, news, oh, yeah. a newspaper article is is useful. An advertisement for a show is useful. Sometimes when you find that little, little blurb that says, oh, this show was canceled because of snow, uh, you know, for something that's assumed took place just because there's an ad. And then, of course, there are attendee memories. And if we're very lucky, there's a concert tape so or video or right. you know, 8 mil or Super 8, whatever it was back then. Uh, so, so many different sorts of sources that you all weave together. There's always for I think every entry that either of us have researched, you know, there's some that have more evidence that make them absolutely concrete that they took place. And there are some that maybe are from itineraries and uh, a bit of hope that they certainly did take place after the fact. Yeah, absolutely. And I've likened, used this metaphor before, I've, I've likened our, our, our research as being a lot like being a paleontologist where you've got to go dig up a dinosaur skeleton. And of course, you know, anytime you find a dinosaur skeleton, it's never 100% complete. If you're lucky, it's 20 or 30% complete. And then you've got to use your intuition and circumstantial evidence and things like that to fill in the blanks for people. And that's a, a lot of this work is a lot like that. Yeah. So like for Mainline, for instance, we don't have a tape of it, right? And there's not a newspaper review of it. But for Mainline, I had a guy completely out of the blue email me and say, hey, I attended the, I think it's November 28th, 74. Somebody can, you know, fact check that for me. It's right around there, uh, 74. And I saw the Charlotte, uh, Kiss in Charlotte, and they did Mainline. I think they were opening for Black Oak, Arkansas. And, you know, kind of raises an eyebrow. It's like, oh, well, okay. That doesn't bend the space-time continuum. It could have happened. But obviously, you'd be really skeptical about that because to, at that point, I'd never known that song to be performed live. Well, a year later, a completely unrelated guy on a completely unsolicited fashion emailed me and s mentioned the same thing. And I thought, hmm, maybe there is something to this. And about a year after that, I was interviewing uh, the late Mick Campisi. I was having a really long dinner with him over in Orlando. Uh, where he was vacationing, and I and I drove over to have dinner with him. And at one point in the evening, um, I said, Mick, what do you remember about rare songs being performed? And he still knew the catalog well enough to knew what a rare song was. He knew that, you know, 100,000 years wasn't rare. So he said, well, let me think about this for a minute. And he said, I remember doing, and I didn't, I didn't lead the witness. I didn't say, hey, do you remember them doing Coming Home or whatever? I just said rare songs. And he said, I remember us doing Mainline somewhere down south. Now, he didn't specifically say Charlotte. He said somewhere down south. So now that's three independent sources who at least claim to have been at the event, and certainly Mick was at it, who have on you know relatively unsolicited fashion given me the same bit of news. So now you're you know relatively confident that that's you know, a, a fairly trustworthy piece of, of information. And then Mick said, and I remember us trying out Strange Way somewhere in Canada. And he said, and it, you know, I loved it, but the guys didn't like it. They thought it was too slow. And so I kind of salted that away for years and years and years until fairly recently, somebody on, on the FAQ, maybe two years ago, mentioned that they not only had some photos, but had attended the show and happened in passing to mention that a friend who attended it with them was a guy who loved to keep journals about concerts he attended. So he would write down interesting things, including the set lists of the shows he went to. And I thought, okay, great. And so I wrote to this, this girl who asked whoever her friend was, and she wrote me back the, the set list. And it was pretty much exactly the set list that I was expecting, except right there in the middle, instead of Parasite, is Strange Ways. And I thought, now, and so you've got that, mixed with mixed memory of playing strange ways somewhere up north there you go there's strange ways now that's nothing compared to a tape of that but it's a type of sleuthing that i think you you, you i think it it's a responsibility for us if we're if we're committed to our task uh to you know report that as you know more than just a rumor you know
Oh, absolutely. You want to be as confident as you can in what you print or publish or communicate or share. Um, you, you know, th there are mystery shows. I mean, I've had reports from people who swear on, you know, on all that's holy to them that they attended a show in Washington in May 75 um, at, and that Kiss scorched the ceiling of the gymnasium. And yeah. I can't find anything on that or haven't been able to yet. Who knows if there is. Um, there's yeah. the, the, the one date that's off. I, I, we talked about this last time. Yakima. Yakima. I, I can. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know. Yakima. But it's the it's these mysteries that drive because once you get one person, then you're looking for that next source because you w may mention it in passing. One source suggests. But when you start getting three, like you do with strange ways, then you become a lot more confident in that information though right you still hope for more and more and more because that's just what we do we <laughs> ne never yeah. enough right yeah absolutely and it was one of the things that was so difficult i'm sure you experienced the same thing about when you've done all your work on your book and you put your work together and you've got all these tidbits that you really want to share with people and you haven't been able to because if you do that, you're gonna cripple the impact of your work. You know, it's like showing everybody nine tenths of their Christmas presents. Well, Christmas morning's gonna be pretty <laughs> pretty dull in comparison then. So yeah, and then you finally get to release it to people and I loved it that I would see all this discussion, not even emails to us, but all this discussion of people going, oh my God, I didn't know that they played, you know, so-and-so and you know, like for instance, like the like the Daisy, uh, we had the Daisy set list in Kiss Alive Forever, and that wasn't you know circulating at all. And it was just a blast to watch people say, "Oh my God, they played Life in the Woods. I wonder what that sounds like." And yeah. you know, nobody had heard it at the time. And so it's it's um, you know, I think you always have to as as a book author or, or creating anything. You can't try to second guess what your audience is going to like. You just got to write for yourself and have faith that there are other going to be other people that like what you're doing. And um, you know that's that's what we did for Kiss Alive Forever, and it, it was always a really a real great treat to have people come up and ask really nerdball questions. <laughs> you know, and it's like, wow, how do you guys figure this out? And you know, so it's 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 fun. And like I've you know shared with you, and certainly with Ross Bradley, uh, with Kurt, uh, Nick. Uh, once you get that first, you know, drop of, uh, it's like a heroin rush or something that research provides, you're like, oh my God, I got to do this again. I got to go find something else. And it's, uh, that's, that's what draws you into it. And, um, yeah, so it's, 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 it's always fun to keep talking about this stuff. Oh, it, it'll never get old. I was interviewing someone yesterday and I, I had some facts and details from the studio and uh, what we were talking about. He's like, you guys are like the CIA. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, yeah. I, I said, no, I'm a junkie. I'm addicted to this stuff. You know, I, I went into a record store on uh, what was it, Monday or Sunday. And did I go to the LPs? No, I went to the box of reel to reels. Uh, all those oh, re wow. recycled, um, you know, seven and a half inch, you know, 15 or 1.5 IPS stuff just to see if there's anything that's saying Kiss, Winterland, 1974, you know, anything like that. No, it was all 50s stuff and jazz. But, right. uh, you know, I've I've bought blank reels just to see maybe, maybe, maybe. So yeah, I think the junkie analog is uh, quite apt so uh, what what do you look forward to surfacing what do you think um not may surface what would be the sorts of things you'd like to see i'm hooked on 74 75 i hope more comes out from yeah. that period i was just watching a 75 um 16 mil transfer today uh and it, it's just wow I, I think that's the era i'm kind of settling into that i really prefer more so than say the uh what was it the fort worth 77 soundboards came yes. out uh, I think that was last year maybe it was the year before but you know certainly I, I think I have more of an affinity with the early stuff I can listen to do strutter hotter than hell, uh, hotter than hell nothing to lose all of that stuff over and over and over more so than, yeah. than maybe the 77 stuff what are the stuff that you would love to see come out I yeah I'm I've always been a fan of that really early early stuff myself uh, it, particularly because and it's something I think you'll uh, commiserate with 74 is so hard to research it, it, it changed so much and on a 
daily basis, the schedule changed. And so uh, just, you know, we spent more time researching that year than any other, including 73, uh, because 73 was, you know, fairly well known. And there's only, you know, less than two dozen shows you got to figure out. Um, but uh, yeah, and so like 70, like the Toronto thing, that that was that was awesome. Um, and there are always, you know, little bits of uh, things. And um, Nick has made a great uh, uh, niche for himself in in being able to take eight millimeter stuff. Now that's only, you know, three minutes here, six minutes there, and nine minutes there, because it's just three minute reels. But um, it's really valuable stuff sometimes because it can show you things that you never, you know, you absolutely never knew. Um, you know, it's like, oh, wow, the kiss, is, kiss sign is on the side of the stage here, or, you know, it's in the front of the stage, or, or you know, little things like that. And if your eye gets good enough, uh, you can actually start to reconstruct set lists from these, these shows, too, just by the moves that the guys are doing, who's singing. Um, and, you know, pretty soon, you know, three or six minutes of video uh, provides you with 80% of the set list for a show. And, you know, poof, there you go. Um, so yeah, I, I would love anything from 74, whether it's an audience recording, a soundboard recording, uh, you know, a, a video, eight millimeter pro shot, whatever, um, is just, you know, pure gold. And it's, it's fascinating, even though it's nowhere near as spectacular as what they ended up doing, especially with the bigger tours, starting with Destroyer and Love Gun and, and Dynasty. Um, it's, it's, it's very raw and very small and kind of amateurish by comparison. Uh, but the band was incredibly tight. I mean, and you have to be. I mean, you're playing six gigs a week. You're going to get pretty tight. And they were. I mean, uh, many people have said it. I'll, I'll echo it. I've never seen the band tighter or hungrier than they were on, like, the Midnight Special oh, uh, uh, appearance. But, but for me, what I would love, and it's certainly possible that it's going to surface, um, maybe even likely, I, I would love to have the five raw concerts uh, that were used for Alive. Yes. Ditto. And that, yeah, because that would be fantastic. Because, I mean, just recently, and unfortunately, it looks like they're lost. Um, we we kind of tracked down uh, some of the King Biscuit Flower Hour things. You remember how Let Me Know yep. and um, Cold Gin and I don't know what else. There's one other song. Um, let me know Cold Gin Rock and Roll All Night, I think it was. We're broadcasting the King Biscuit Flower Hour, and there was some evidence that the studio uh, back east um, had these tapes, and it was multi-track. It was 16-track uh, tapes. So it, it wasn't the originals. I'm sure they would have um, uh, just done a duplicate of the 16-track tapes. But can you imagine getting that? you know how much fun it would be? to play around with like, let me know where you can like, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna drop the overhead mic over Peter's drums back in the mix. And I'm gonna bring up the bass a little bit. And you could literally play engineer with all 16 tracks of a raw, a live tape. And that type of stuff really geeks me out. But all five of those concerts, you know, obviously recorded and they had weird set lists. I mean, really weird stuff. I mean, because they, you know, uh, I know they even recorded, you know, Strange Ways, for instance, um, you know, at Soundcheck for Davenport, I think it was. Um, and that was on tape. And, you know, everything else that got dropped in, Room Service and Watching You, which wasn't typically in the set list, and, you know, Rock Bottom and all the other weird stuff. All those those were fairly weird set lists, you know, in Detroit and Cleveland and uh, uh, Wildwood and, and Davenport would love to hear the raw raw tapes of those even if they have you know missing vocals or ace fudges a note who cares i i, it, I could not care you know just to, as you're saying i could see the expression on your face as you're talking about if you know it, it would just yeah. be, you know i i don't think you've lived until you've messed with multi-tracks i've got a two inch tape behind me and some of the stuff that came off there you know just the amount of fun that oh, you yeah. can have with it is sick, and you, you don't need any super duper technology to do it at home to enjoy it. I would love to see you know all of those shows, you know, just kind of mixed. Give them to Eddie Kramer to um, just do mixed downs yeah. of them and put them out as a box, 
you know, there are the five source shows for Alive. Here you can listen to each one of them individually. And then if you get the super duper version, you can go online and get the multi tracks and download them to your machine to play with and uh, fiddle around. And, and that's been done for, you know, some tracks out there. Um, I don't know if they're the proper you know, 16 yeah. tracks, but, you know, they do allow you kind of a faux way of messing around with the mixes slightly. Yeah, 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 I, I agree. And, and you know, to be able to take a multi-track thing, and, and the, the same place also had the multi-track of either an early version, a demo version um, of um, Rock and Roll All Night from Larrabee Sound. Um, and because they recorded Rock and Roll All Night, or at least the initial basic tracks out in California at Larrabee in the end of January, and then took the tapes with them and, and either re-recorded from start to finish or finished up on the same multi-track uh, up in New York at uh, Record Plant or Electric Lady, wherever. I think it was Electric Lady uh, for Just to Kill. And to have the 16-track multi-track with, with that from Larrabee, which... I think, if, if my guess is correct, um, that was the multi-track that they used when they did the Smashes and Thrashes version because it's got a different bass line in it than when Gene um, uh, did it for the, the Dress to Kill take. And, you know, I've, I've heard the demo that was recorded, and it's got basically the Smashes and Thrashes bass line and Rock and Roll All Night to it. So this multi-track, if it's from Larrabee, may very well have had that that baseline uh, in it too and to be able to to solo tracks like you know be able to, to solo the track of everybody singing the chorus where you had like six people around a mic yep. singing the chorus that stuff would just be unbelievable um so yeah there's, there's a lot of stuff out there that we don't know about toronto classic example who knows when stuff's gonna fall out of the sky like that but for me personally um, other than weird things that are just utterly shrouded in mist, like those July 74 shows in Charlotte and Baltimore, where we've got a, the, <laughs> yeah. the travel itinerary. Yeah, just Glenn, like, Glenn Burney, wasn't was it? What was the show? What was the show? Was there a show? Was that, yeah. Uh, excluding stuff like that. Um, for me, being from St. Louis, I would absolutely love to get something from the Keishi Kite Fest. And there are photos from the newspaper where you can see people up in the trees in Forest Park. There's at least one where somebody is holding an eight millimeter camera. And to my goal in life, I want to find that guy because <laughs> I'd love to see eight millimeter footage of, of that show. And it's unfortunate the, the next year when Rush did it with Charlie Daniels, uh, the Keishi Kite Fest, they did Keishi, the, the, the station there in St. Louis, did live remotes. But with the Kiss show, they were so unprepared for this. And, you know, th there's a famous story about Keishi originally um, having four kind of crappy generators for Kiss. And then mm. one stopped working. <laughs> and then the next one stopped working. And at the end of the show, Kiss was playing to 100,000 people with a tiny little Honda <laughs> generator <laughs> powering all of this. Um, but, um, yeah, I'd love to, to, to see uh, footage uh, uh, from that show because it was it was so unique in you know arguably in in the top what three top five largest crowds i've ever played to very much uh, so. very early on ever. to hit it's, such a large crowd absolutely insane yeah it's just huge because if you've ever been to forest park and being a st louis kid i have uh many times if you see a couple of those shots of the crowd from the stage you really you'll begin to realize how far out those fields go and you just see nothing but people as far as the eye could see. And uh, so that must have been pretty stunning for them to crawl out of a windowless van thinking they're going to be playing a little, you know, park with a swing set. And <laughs> here's the sea of people. But, but what about you? Do you have anything in particular that you um, either suspect is out there or would, you know, really hope um, is out there? You know, you know, uh, um, and 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 you're starting to get very dark, so I guess your your sun's oh. going down. Oh, yeah. Ah, there there we go. That's better. Um, okay. You, you, as far as the early stuff goes, I was I know that there's Peter Chris footage pre kiss. 
we yeah. know, we know that there's very early ace footage from that uh, New York Dolls uh, documentary uh, pre kiss. I am curious about whether there is Gene Simmons pre kiss footage. Um, they did bar mitzvahs, bar mitzvahs, um, kind of the stuff where you would almost expect a video camera an early to yeah. be present and maybe have a band in the background. Is there anything up in the Catskills? Um, from bullfrog beer, Frog beer long island sounds earlier than that you know or even you know is there more lester um so if i'm to pick any right. one of those things we know there's a lester tape i would love to hear that yeah um i, I think most fans have this kind of a, a this strange relationship with wicked lester we know it's weird we know it's eclectic we've heard multiple versions of the original i guess the in progress stuff with steve and then the more defined stuff with ron the 76 remix yeah. done yeah uh, the 2001 remix or remaster all that stuff so we've heard all these different versions i like to see that as a mm -hmm. box with the uh the live tape put out for whatever it is quality wise i i, I think yeah. The uh, the Daisy tape was a lost opportunity for 73 stuff. And, you know, we all ood and ought, oh, there's two versions of uh, Life in the Woods, uh, you know, and more versions of Acrobat, stuff like that. You know, what would be the opinion of that? Um, that rain I, I guess it's a rainbow tape, not Wicked Lester, isn't it? So, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. It's... Just to be pedantic uh, on the point. So I, I think that that's probably mine. I'll take, uh, you know, 74 shows dropping out of the sky anytime anyone wants to drop one now that I've uh, yeah. you know, ha had a taste because there still aren't that many from that year. So, 74. Yeah. And Toronto is a great, you know, if you, if you were just look at the whole year, you could, and, and you wanted to cherry pick areas where you don't have a tape and you don't know much about it, Toronto just hit that spot because it was great to get something from that short little, you know, three to four weeks between when they finished recording the, the Hotter Than Hell album and when they took a break uh, for a couple of weeks in early October. And to get a set list from that uh, and a complete one, it seems, at that was was really great. And that's how you find, you know, stuff out like, wow, you know, Parasite's in there. So, yeah, there are a couple little pockets in there, you know, like November would be another great, great area to, to get uh, to get one. Um, and and it, to figure out when did they add Hotter Than Hell? When did they add Watching You? When did, you know, all this stuff coming out of the set list? And so, yeah, that was a really perfect spot to, you know, have one fall out of the sky. And so, yeah, it was really, it was really exciting stuff. I, I completely agree. I just found a bloody typo on the uh, concert history part of my website. Thunder Chicken, Cornstalk, oh. Michigan, Cornstalk, it's Comstock. That's true. Oh, yeah. Comstock, Michigan. And there's some evidence. Which show was it? The Thunder Chicken from October, or the one from May? The one from October was the one where I just found the typo. So. Okay, yeah, because the, the one in May, um, there's actually some evidence that that didn't even happen. So, um, you know, who knows who knows what that is, which is always tough when you find uh, you, you find things that contradict something that you already put in. And it's like, is that enough to change my mind? And it, it's it's always a very fluid decision making process. But um, again, that's what we love, that we do like yeah. these things, that the evidence that comes along that then sways you in a different direction or yeah. uh, makes you start looking at other things. And then you run into a, a discovery, you know, say right. it's a, a show happening was scheduled one place, but it happened down the road, you know, or yeah. and, and anything's possible. I can't think of any examples yeah. of that. And, but. And, and you brought up Wicked Lester a few minutes ago. Um, that's one of the things that Kurt and I've been really delving into recently um, is to uh, really figure out when those gigs happened. I think I think there were six of them, possibly seven. Um, but you, the memory, and it's all relying on people's memories because there's almost no paperwork back then. We have exhausted, and I mean exhausted. All of the newspaper shows. Uh, th there was a, a, a gig that Paul and Gene have talked about. Uh, as did Brooke, uh, where and it's it's the last Wicked Lester gig where they played a B'nai B'rith, uh, which is a Jewish youth Jewish youth organization um, event in Atlantic City at a hotel, and this would have been late summer 1971. And they've all individually said this: Yeah, we played a long set, and uh, it was the biggest crowd we ever played to, and that was literally the last Wicked Wicked Lester gig. Well, I've gone through every newspaper in Atlantic City. There's nothing about – I wasn't looking for, hey, Wicked Lester is playing the such-and-such such ballroom. I was looking for the B'nai B'rith event. 
and there's nothing in the newspaper. I called the historical society. They've got nothing. I talked to the B'nai B'rith organization. They forwarded me to their official historic archive person in Cincinnati who went through their, you know, each of their, each of their organizations in, in each of the cities kept really diligent notes on what was going on in the area. And they looked through the Atlantic, the New Jersey chapter, whatever it was, from that time frame for an event anywhere in July, August, September 1971, and there was nothing. It, which is why it is so unbelievably frustrating to try to figure this stuff out because you've got, with Wicked Lester, you have almost nothing but people's memories to go on. So that, that was the last one. The first one you just uh, you know, kind of brought up was the Richmond Community College thing where we've got a tape, which is a, a rainbow gig, with, which has got lots of great early Kiss stuff on it. You know, Eskimo's Son, which became Only You, and uh, I think She's on there, and Simple Type, and Sunday Driver. And then a couple of the other, you know, weird Gene songs, uh, Lita, what, maybe was it Lita on there? Or, I don't know if My Uncle is a Raft, and I think Go Now is on there, the Moody Blues song, so, which would be fascinating to, to hear. And I know, I know the tape exists because uh, Brooke, Brooke had it, and I know Ken Sharp has heard it, which is how we got the set list, uh, you know, uh, to begin with. But so that was the first show. And then Brooke um, had remembered playing a prom at McManus Middle School where he was teaching. Um, at the time, uh, we know there's a Rivoli Theater gig, which we talked about in Kiss Live Forever. That's the one that you had the uh, photo of, isn't it, for the book? Correct. Yep. Yeah, correct. Uh, there was a gig that Gene mentioned taking place um, outdoors in a little park uh, it, near near the Rivoli Theater in South Fallsburg. Um, and there was one at a club on the Jersey Shores called the Osprey. And I actually called the Osprey up. It's been there forever. I talked to a manager who had been there since 1975, and he said, unfortunately, they don't keep any records in the local newspaper. Listed bands, but the only thing they ever listed was the house band mm -hmm. that was uh, playing there. So you're left with nothing to go on. But it's a really important piece of, of history, and I, I'd love to be able to nail this stuff down. But um, so, you know, we tracked, I talked to Larry DiMarzio um, a couple weeks ago to ask his memories about it because he was kind of instrumental in, in getting Gene and Paul together because uh, he, he was in a band with Brooke um, and Larry was a great guy and Paul, or uh, Paul, Kurt has talked to a bunch of the guys from Bullfrog Beer um, and uh, I don't think there's any pictures or film or whatever forthcoming but you know. Uh, one of the guys actually had no clue that Gene Klein was Gene Simmons until <laughs> her told him. <laughs> oh, wow. That, that blows my hilarious. mind. Oh, my God. Yeah, he's like, wait a second. Gene was Gene Simmons? It's like, yeah, you didn't know that? It's like, no, he honestly had no clue. None. So, yeah, you're left with people's memories. And sometimes that's all you get to go with. But, you know, hopefully you'll get that you keep you keep uh, after it, and you'll get that that break in the case, so to speak. And uh, you know, it's like ah, Eureka, we find it. And so the only the only uh, Wicked Lester gig we can pin down with any accuracy is the Rivoli Theater gig in South Fallsburg. And if you want a new piece of information, he announced right here. I they played after a movie that night at the Rivoli Theater. I know what the movie is. Do you want to take a guess? Uh, this is 1971. 71, Godfather. And it was a no. It was a big. I think that was 72. It was a big, big movie, and it was part of kind of the disaster movies that were really popular in the 70s. Um, oh, you know, but, but Towering Inferno and 71, disaster. Uh, it, the movie came out in 1970 and, and had like four sequels. Four sequels. Oh, Poseidon Adventure. Mm-mm. Uh. Airport. Oh, seriously? Wow. Yep. Oh, okay. that's what. That seems to be what was. Show, it was certainly showing that week. Um, so I don't. I don't know what other else. And there was a seven thirty and ten thirty showing, of Airport, and they would have gone on after the ten thirty showing, which is why Paul's memory is that yeah, we took the stage at about one in the morning, and I just wanted to go to bed. <laughs> But uh, yeah, so see, there you go. There's a new piece of information that we didn't know up until three weeks ago. Um, and uh, just Julian's just proven how much he doesn't know about early 1970s disaster movies. <laughs> <laughs> or, yeah. or movies in general, for that matter. So Yeah.
Yeah, so there's a there's a very obscure bit of Kiss or Wicked Lester trivia. It's what was the movie showing at the Rivoli Theater the night Wicked Lester played there? But yeah, hopefully, you know, this stuff, you know, we get lucky and stuff falls out of the sky. And it, and it always fills in something. It always fills in some little bit of information that's useful later on. And if it's and, and if it's only useful for personal satisfaction, you know, again, I, I I've I've mentioned that I do things from a selfish motivation because I want to know stuff, whether or not anyone else enjoys the stuff that uh, I've managed to uncover yeah, and put yeah. together is, you know, I'm I'm thrilled when people are, but I've done it for myself first and foremost, and continue right. to, I, I continue to be unable to step away from it because there are still things that bother me, still things that I want to know, and uh, yeah, it, I'm I'm only going to be able to have conversations with a very small percentage of kiss fans uh about this stuff because everyone else reads it oh that's cool and moves on with their lives gets back to yeah it. yeah meanwhile well, back into the library i go that's that's what was fascinating for me having spent so much time on kiss alive forever reading about you know the work that you've done on kiss's concerts uh that you both published and you know they have uh, a great deal of a poster on kiss monster is that you know you're a fresh set of eyes coming to you know a similar set of data and you know you'll find a little bit different things than than we did. And for me, that that's what's really interesting about it. It's not I don't feel any competitive vibe. I, I feel a curious vibe. It's like oh, Julian's got a fresh set of eyes. Wonder what he came up with. And there were little things you know like you you had found at a Columbus, Ohio show in October '74, being called Frigid Pink. That's right. Uh, Open the thing, and I was like, what? And that spurred me to contact the guys from Frigid Pink and said, do you remember opening from Col in Columbus? And the two guys I talked to said, no, we didn't open Columbus, but we did play a concert with them um, uh, outside of Detroit um, in, you know, right after their first album came out. So there possibly is a un unknown 1974 gig. At a, at a roller rink, and I asked them if it was the, the one in Wyandotte, and they said, no, 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 it was not in Wyandotte. I forget the name of the town. They said it was like a Detroit suburb, and uh, and I, I haven't found anything to confirm it other than other than their memories, but, you know, that's what's cool. People, you know, people can go out there and do their own research, and it comes up with a, a different set of results. It just helps, you know, fill in the picture. And then and, there's going to be Ross Radley with his work, you know, hopefully bringing yet another set of eyes to a very similar set of data again, as you mentioned, you know, yeah. when, when someone puts it together sequentially from a, a completely different perspective, you know, everyone benefits from all of these efforts. And, and that's what I think, you know, we're, we're all kind of working towards the same goal through different means, yeah. through different points of interest. And the KISS Army will benefit from that effort. Um, and so everyone's a winner in this case. Yeah, ab absolutely. It's a lot like the scientific community where people do their own area of research and then it's kind of peer reviewed, mm -hmm. so to speak. And it just gets closer to, you know, some semblance of truth. Just the other day, uh, you know, I mentioned I'd done a ton of research on those kissing contests. Well, Ross has always been, you know, the photo expert. He, that's his, his approach to research and kiss yep. is, you know, incredibly photo intensive because, you know, photos really answer a lot of questions. Of course, they also bring up as many questions as they answer, but he had found a, a photo of the kissing contest that I'd never seen before. And he's like, what do you think of this? And I was like, wow, that's fantastic. And then I was able to turn around and say, okay, the people in your picture there are this, 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 this. And I was able to, I was able to give them names for all of the people uh, in the picture. It was, you can see maybe six couples of the 12 that took part in the June 74 uh, kiss off in Woodfield. And, um, you know, I just by stitching together, you know, various photos from various newspapers, I was able to, okay, that's this couple on the second row. That's this couple in the fourth <laughs> row. And here you are, you know, you're able to help, you know, you know, Ross helped me out with a photo and I helped him out with, you know, the caption. And so, <laughs> excellent, you know, you know, we are able to, you know, help, help each other out. But, uh, yeah, and it, and it's all eventually in a roundabout way kind of serves to, you know, fulfill uh, a larger truth and just clarifying the the age-old stories of this this band that we all like. So Absolutely. I'm going to end on this little yeah. nugget. Um I yeah. love being wrong. I love when people come to me with say, "Hey, this uh is wrong." 
because I learned something again from that selfish point of view. I learn yeah. or I go back and reapproach it from a different again from that different perspective. So uh, never be one to get butt hurt about someone correcting you or offering information. Take it you know graciously and warmly that someone's given you some information and what you do with it and how how you take that criticism or correction can really be a benefit that's, that's something i learned very early on in uh doing this stuff that uh you have to be receptive to other people's thoughts and uh you know experiences stuff that they know i yeah i couldn't agree more because the, the whole idea is to you know get to this you know get to this truth get to the the, the accurate part of it and if that's what you're really genuinely interested in, you're delighted to, to, to be wrong. If you're there just for the ego you know, kick of being, hey, I know something you don't, and somebody questions you, that's when you get all irritated over some trivial bit of nonsense. And uh, then you end up with a ridiculous fight on, 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 a, on, a, on a website or whatever. And uh, yeah, I, uh, I think we're both too old to waste good energy on bad conversation like that. Oh yeah, <laughs> yep, it's, uh, it, it's over very quickly. Yeah, but real quick, I'm gonna do an absolutely shameless show again for anybody who's interested uh, in in the Vinny the Vinny uh, special Vinny uh, version. And there's you know you're seeing this in stereo now <laughs> <laughs> um, of Kiss Alive Forever. Mm -hmm. Um, reach out to us at billboardbooks at icloud.com, and uh, we can fill you in on, on how to get the book. There aren't too many left, and we'd like to give them all homes. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, please let us know. And thank you again so much for you know uh, having me on again, Julian. It's, a, it's always great talking about all this nerdy stuff, even if we're one of only six people who care. <laughs> <laughs> Well, well, that's how it should be. You know, I look for the next next time that we can get together in person. You know, Skype is wonderful, and I appreciate you giving time to everyone to come on the show and talk about Toronto and all these other topics that we've touched on. That's the that's yeah. the gold. The the nuggets that are in this conversation, uh, I'm sure six people will totally appreciate, and everyone else should get something out of as well, even if they hit their little fast forward button now and then just to see if we've moved on yeah, from uh, exactly. at least any point that they find boring. So Jeff Seuss, yeah. co-author, Kiss Alive Forever. Thank you so much for joining us on the Kiss FAQ podcast today. And uh, thank you for everyone for listening. And we'll see you next time. Thanks, Julian. Thank you for spending time listening to the Kiss FAQ podcast today. All sales are final. There are no refunds. If you'd like, look us up on Facebook or come over to the Kiss FAQ message board and discuss the topic we broadcast today. Don't forget to rate us on iTunes, Spreaker, or wherever you've listened to the show. We hope you'll join us again. Thank you.